from the very beginning, uh, but now we don't believe that anymore. Now we believe it's not conserved, and therefore we have we can build theories for how the excess of matter over antimatter that we currently see could have been created shortly after inflation. Yeah? You mentioned that uh, miracle number two is true even in Newtonian physics. Yes. Can you share a conceptual example to help us understand miracle number two in, in Newtonian physics? So yeah. Simple? Yeah, sure, I, I can. Uh, yeah, let me do it. Um, I'll have to draw a picture with my hands, I think. It'll work, I think. Um, you'll need to know a little bit about Newtonian physics, but I probably won't say anything you don't already know. Uh, let's imagine that we have a thin shell of mass, a uh, thin spherical shell. So here's my thin spherical shell of mass. Now we're going to need to know what the gravitational field of a thin spherical shell is. Newton actually did know this. He worked it out. Uh, the answer is that outside of the shell, the gravitational field is exactly the same as if you had the same amount of mass concentrated as a point at the center. It's just a simple 1 over r squared gravitational field outside of the shell. On the inside of the shell, uh, if I'm here, I'm attracted to the mass on this side, which is close, but there's more mass on the other side, but it's further away. Uh, what Newton himself was able to show is that it exactly cancels. Inside the shell, the gravitational field is exactly zero. Okay, now furthermore, if we ask what's exactly happening on the surface, on the surface, the gravitational field is if we make the surface a little bit thick so we can see inside it, uh, the gravitational field is going from the zero value it has inside to the full value it has outside. So on the average, it's half of that strength is what it turns out. Uh, all that really matters is, is the sign in this case. Uh, so acting on the shell, there really is a gravitational force pulling inward. If the shell is not strong enough, it will be crushed by its own gravity. Uh, so there's an inward force on the shell. Okay, now, now we're going to do a thought experiment. I'm going to imagine making the shell out of something that's mushy enough so that I can let it contract under its own gravitational force without crumbling. It will we'll stay a shell, we'll assume. It's made out of that kind of putty. Uh, as it contracts, there's a force pulling it inward. I can take advantage of that to extract energy from the system. I can imagine tying a lot of little strings to the outside of this putty-like sphere, and as it pulls itself inward, it will pull on those strings the strings can turn generators. I can literally extract energy uh, as the shell collapses. Everybody still with me? Mm -hmm. We now have a collapsed shell and we've got energy out of it. Now let's think about what's happened to the gravitational field during this process. If we um, drew a dotted line where the shell started, outside of that dotted line, the gravitational field will still be exactly what it was before, no change. The same as if we just had that same total mass concentrated at the center. If we look inside the final radius of the shell, the gravitational field started zero and is still zero. So there's no change in the gravitational field there either. But in the region that was traversed by the shell as it came inward, previously we had no gravitational field there. Now we have a gravitational field there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the same 1 over r squared gravitational field that we have outside. So the net effect of this entire operation, if you keep track of everything, is that we took energy out of the system and we created some gravitational field where there previously was none. Uh, so if energy is conserved, there's only one choice, and that is that the that extra gravitational field actually has negative energy. So the energy of the gravitational field went down as the energy of our light bulbs turned by these generators went up. Thank you. Simple. Bravo. <laughs> Okay, miracle, right? It really is. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, so, so the gravitational field really does have negative energy, as I said, either in, in it's true in Newtonian physics and it's also true in general relativity. Uh, and the total energy of our universe is consistent with being zero. Uh, that is, it's perfectly consistent to believe within the accuracy of our measurements uh, that the negative energy associated with the gravitational field in our universe completely compensates for all of the matter in the universe, making our entire universe a zero energy item. Hmm. Okay, so I actually have, I'm done now describing the scenario. Uh, uh, let me stop there, ask if there are any more questions, and the next thing I want to talk to you about is, is reasons why we might believe that the universe actually did this, and that's not just a, a nice story that one can tell on a Friday evening. Uh, so, any questions? Yeah? you have an estimate of how many particles might be in the marble-sized universe? You know, the 
So they were from the map of the universe now, and you can know the, uh, uh, the temperature or, or energy when it was that size. So right. Can, can That's right. Yeah, we can be, that, we can give a number to that. Uh, the number is different before and after the decay of this false vacuum. Uh, a lot of particles, almost all the particles we see, are produced when this material decays. Uh, while it's in this undecayed state, while it's in this negative pressure state, uh, it's a state that's so peculiar that one doesn't really describe it in terms of particles. Uh, one describes it in terms of fields. Uh, if one did try to count particles in some qualitative way, uh, the number would probably be something like about 10 to the 15 or something uh, while it's in the repulsive gravity phase. Then when it decays to ordinary matter, then things are more clear because we know how ordinary matter behaves at those temperatures, we think. Uh, and uh, then the number is about 10 to the 80th. Uh, the fluids have viscosity, and, and that sounds like enough uh, particles that it could almost be considered a, a fluid. Uh, we do consider it a fluid, that's right. You know, turbulence, viscosity, those things? Uh, yeah, uh, turbulence or laminar flow, they... they uh, um, we believe that it can be treated very well as an ideal fluid. Um, why do we believe that? One of the reasons might be that we don't know much about viscosity, so we leave it out. Um, now, I'm sure people have looked at that. Um, it, it, the, the point is that these particles are, uh, at these energies, very weakly interacting particles, actually. Uh, so they pretty much behave uh, as you'd expect an ideal gas to behave. So anyone can try to calculate those corrections, but I, I, I'm, I'm sure people have looked at it, and the conclusion has been uh, that there does not appear to be any kind of viscosity, significant viscosity <coughs> effect. Yes, the question, is, the one I talked to you about uh, while you were having your time, <laughs> is this, oh, yes, uh, sure comes in. did this uh, That's a good time expansion to outrun the speed of light? That's right, okay. Did, did the uh, expansion outrun the speed of light? Well, if you look at the numbers I gave you, it certainly must have. Uh, I've told you that the universe went from the size uh, smaller than a proton uh, to the size of a marble in 10 to the minus 35 seconds. Uh, now, the speed of light is only 3 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second. Uh, so in 10 to the minus 35 seconds, it should only go 10 to the minus 25 centimeters, not 1 centimeter. So it, it, it has vastly outrun the speed of light. Uh, and uh, does that mean that, that Alan Duth forgot his special relativity? Uh, no, uh, it doesn't mean he forgot his special relativity. Um, what it means is that he's using general relativity instead. Um, now, in general relativity, you don't evade completely this idea that nothing travels faster than light. It's still true that nothing travels faster than light in general relativity, but you have to be more careful about what exactly you mean by that statement. Uh, so it's still true, whether you're talking about general relativity or special relativity, that if I have a particle and a light beam and let them have a race, uh, the light beam will always win, absolutely every time. Nothing travels faster than light. Uh, so in that sense, the speed of light is the maximum speed. What makes general relativity different from special relativity, and that's the key thing that's going on here, is that in special relativity, space itself is just a rigid background. Nothing can happen to space in special relativity. But as you probably know, um, Einstein's general relativity theory is really a theory about the distortion of space, about space-time geometry itself becoming dynamical. And all the effects of gravity are described as the bending, twisting, and stretching of space-time. Uh, so when space can stretch, two <coughs> things can get further apart just because the space between them stretched, not because they're moving in any real sense. Uh, and it turns out that general relativity imposes no limit at all on how fast space can stretch. Uh, so what's happening in the early universe here is that space is stretching. Uh, the relative motion of any particles that are near enough to see each other is always less than the velocity of light. But nonetheless, the total distance between here and here, because all the space between them stretched, can increase at a rate which is much, much larger than the speed of light. Uh, and this, by the way, is not true only in inflation. It really is true in conventional cosmology before inflation before we knew about inflation as well. 